Eric Tanner's in a position to testify that Wes and those other players assaulted you. All you have to do is confirm it in court. If I do, what happens? Oh, jury hears that. They're gonna see things different. They're gonna let me off. It'll have more effect in the sentencing phase. They're gonna convict me. You committed involuntary manslaughter. But there are clear mitigating circumstances that could reduce your sentence. Maybe remove it. Eric's testimony is compelling. What he tells a jury will matter. How much time would I get if I took a plea deal? Why? Why would you? How much time? You don't need a I'm deal. talking to my lawyer. What's the best deal you could get? Best. Maybe 10 years. Five served. Less with supervision. That's a guess. Maybe five years. Served in prison. They're trying you as an adult. Connor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I love this show so much. Uh, last season was great. I love this Someone season. Someone agrees with you, I know. And, and I gotta say, you know, we get, we, we, we get a lot of actors, we get a lot of directors coming up here, but I think it was about midway through this season where we were like, we have to get Connor Jess up. We have to interview him. It's such a great character and he's, he's so compelling in the show. I wanna talk to him about it. So congratulations. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, such a weird setup. It's like, congratulations by, for being liked by me. Um, <laughs> it's a compliment, I'll take it. Uh, so talk to me, let's go, back to the, let's go back to the beginning and then maybe we'll get to the end and tease the finale a little bit, but how did Seems you- like a good place to start. How did you get this part and what sort of conversations did you have with John Ridley when you did get the part? Um, the, the story of me, I'm running out of time to come up with a better story because the season's ending, but uh, the story is actually quite uh, boring of how I got the part. I auditioned for it, I t put myself on tape. I live in, uh, in Toronto, so I taped myself and then a week later I was in LA testing for the show with, with John, and then a week after that, I was in Austin getting ready to shoot the show. So it was very quick. Two week process. Two or three weeks, yeah. And for my, a role like this, wow. Yeah, they, well I think uh, it, there was a, the, the process of this character before I even entered the picture was quite extensive. For a while, uh, it was conceived as uh, a girl, not a, it, was a, it was a daughter, not a son. Um, so I, I think it was relatively late in the game that they changed their minds on that. So yeah, it was, it, was, it was very fast. And there wasn't a script available. There really wasn't any information. I didn't know anything about the, about the season. I knew about last season, but because the stories are completely self-contained, I didn't know anything. Uh, I didn't know about a se the sexual assault. I didn't know, I didn't know, I had no details. What did you know? I mean, what did you have to do on, <laughs> I knew uh, on when you videotaped yourself? Uh, they, there was a few scenes that actually didn't even make it into the show. And oh. there were kind of oblique references in those scenes to I wish I could forget what happened that night. Everyone just keeps talking about what happened that, so uh, I knew something had happened mm -hmm. and I used my imagination, but I didn't know any particulars. Um, and that sort of work operating in the dark like that main continued through the whole show. Like we really didn't know, plot wise, we had no idea what was happening until we read the script like a few days or a week before we shot it. Um, so that's sort of how John, how John works. So you knew when you, when you signed on that they had initially thought of the character as a woman and then they, yeah. they decided to make it a young man. Did you ever talk to anybody about why they made that decision or what, what was the impulse behind that? Um, I know John's talked about it a bit. Uh, he never talked about it to me, so I, I'm just, I would just be parroting what I've heard him say. Um, I think he thought that it was, um, for a lot of, uh, viewers, it would be, or at least for himself, it would be a more challenging yeah. thing to uh, to approach because it's something that you're you're not as used to seeing. You're not. It's it's something I think a lot of people still don't really acknowledge. Um, so I think that was appealing to him. You know, if you watch the show, you know that he enjoys very much playing with expectation. Yeah. Um, so that I think is probably the main thing. No, I think it's uh, episode two, maybe episode three. I'm going back a little bit because I think I watched like the first four when I had press screeners before they all aired. So I'm going way back for myself. It but feels like a long time ago. The episode where you, uh, essentially your character, uh, has to take a rape kit. Yeah. Um, what was it like shooting that scene? I have to ask, that scene is so powerful 
And I've talked about it with John, and I've said one of the things that makes it so powerful is the expectation of watching uh, a man have to, have to go through this scenario. And John told me that the person in the scene with you was someone who actually conducts those tests, is an actual doctor. Yeah, she's a, she's a trauma nurse. So she, um, uh, that's, that's her job, uh, more or less. And there was a scene scripted in the, in the script. It was, it was much shorter. Um, and when she came on board and we started talking and we started talking with Clement, the director, and with John, um, it became obvious that the best way to do it was to just, for her to just sort of give me the exam. To especially the exam itself in real life lasts much much longer than it's portrayed. It's like it's like a, a multiple hour long exam, um, so we had to condense it for obvious reasons. But other than that, she just I had no idea what she was going to ask me. I had um, they just kind of let her let her go, um, and it, it 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 was really because that's sort of Taylor's experience too, is because he doesn't know what's coming. He doesn't know what she's going to ask. He doesn't know what this entails. So in, as it starts off very innocuous, like, you know, very innocent questions, very matter-of-fact questions, then it kind of, it, as she gets into the meat of it, it gets more intense and more intrusive, and, and that was my experience shooting it, and it was certainly on a much higher level, um, a much more intense level, that was Taylor's experience in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how do you feel about Taylor's relationship with his mother, portrayed by the amazing Lily Taylor? She's just incredible. The relentlessly genius. A hundred percent. And but in regards to this relationship, it's really like he stands by her, even though it seems like he feels like she is really kind of the cause of a lot of his pain in this scenario. Like he would have just gotten over it almost if it wasn't for his mother. I find that their relationship is one of the most interesting things about the show to me, or you know, one of the most interesting things about my part of the show to me is that they are both coming from a place very explicitly of, and very honestly, of trying to do what's best for the other one. Taylor wants to protect his mom. They have a history. He, he, he knows that she's a little unstable and she's fragile and he's trying to protect her. And she obviously is trying to, in her own way, defend him and try and uh, get justice for him. She's trying to do right by him, even if you don't necessarily think she's always doing it the right way. Um, and it's interesting to me the two characters who are operating from a place, from a very similar place of love and uh, defense for each other, by doing that, push each other further apart. Like, it's, as the season goes on, they get more and more distant from each other. Taylor doesn't want any part in what Anne is trying to do, and doesn't really ask Taylor the right questions. She can be quite frustrating. Um, and I think that is a, one of the more interesting and probably more honest uh, parts of the whole of the whole show is that dynamic. I find it really intriguing. Yeah, absolutely. The in I think it's episode seven, right? Is the episode with the with the shooting? Is the truth? <laughs> yeah. Um, spoiler for those who haven't seen it. Um, but the the final scene in that episode in the diner is so beautiful. It's it's something that it's a it's a rarity that we get to see something that honest and, and what seems so so subtle on, on television. Can you talk to me about sort of creating that scene with, with, with Lily? How do you guys go about it? Is it simply just sort of doing the work and going by the script, or do you guys have major conversations about how you're going to block it and how you feel about it? Um, that scene is a great example of, uh, you know, John directed that, he wrote and directed that episode. That scene, if it works, it's entirely because of John. He had... He had it all mapped out before we got there. He had an in, in, incredibly intricate blocking. Yeah. He had, um, so it was, we were really just pieces in that. But on top, but what I think what makes it work is that it's very easy, or it's not very easy, but it's, it's very easy to fall into those sort of long takes and it just becomes a technical exercise. Um, and you know, if the camera doesn't bump and if it works and if the people are in the right places at the right time, then you move on. But John threw out all of that because it's a very technically complicated shot. Um, uh, he never forgot that what the point of the scene was. Like, he never forgot that it's not, the scene is not about being one shot. The scene is about, uh, the one shot is about these two people coming together in this moment. Um, and that is a testament to John. And that's really representative of the whole season is that his approach to that. So no, it's, um, you know, we tried to do what we could, and Lily and I got along really well, and we worked really well together. Um, but we owe a lot. Of, that was all in the script. That was how many? All. How many takes did you do? Not very many. We rehearsed it a lot. Like we we rehearsed it 
a lot. Um, but I think we only did six or seven takes, um, which is a real testament to not to just to John, but to our whole crew. It's like one of the it's one of the best crews I've ever worked with. Like that is a hard <laughs> that's a hard shot to do, and we never not once had to go again or reset or anything because of a technical problem, wow. um, which is if you know. How, how hard that kind of shot is, it's, it's saying something. I mean, yeah, you get technical problems on slow push-ins, let alone something that's doing what every, the, the, that that camera is doing in that scene. I, like, I knew our crew was good, uh, but it wasn't until that, until that scene that I knew how good they were. Now, we're talking about this shot, and, and that shot is, is, is a marvel, a technical feat, but so much of the show is also covered differently. The scenes are covered in a much different way. Were you aware that it was going to be like that when you sat down to do your first scene? Or were you like, oh, the camera's just going to be on me the whole time? We're not going to get their coverage? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was actually one of the, that kind of formal device is one, was one of the most exciting things to me about the show. Because yeah. that, in a slightly different way, but very similarly, uh, that's the style of season one. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that in season one. Uh, you know, in TV, I've, I've done a fair amount of, of, of TV, and even in movies, in most movies, there's formally it's very predictable. You know that 95% of the time you're only going to be on camera if you're talking or if you have like a major thing you're supposed to react to. Um, and so much of that is a filmmaker sort of covering their ass. It's kind exactly. of like, I might not have the chops to get in the editing yeah. room and only have covered it one way. I better make sure that all the information's there just in case. Exactly. It, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're protecting yourself, but it's also just like that's what it's palatable. You know it works. That's what people are used to. Um, you know it'll cut together. It's very, you know, it's, it's tried and true. Um, but with this show, you really have no idea, like you said, like if the camera's pointing at you, um, you might be on camera for two minutes without cutting, or you might be in a long scene and never be on camera. You really have no idea when you're shooting something how it's going to look, or you can, or it might, you know, it might cut ahead or splice back to something. It, it, this, the editing is really um, adventurous. So that, in a weird way, it, despite kind of the uh, the claustrophobia that it that it cre the sense of claustrophobia that it creates when you're shooting, it's really mostly a sense of liberation. Because you don't have to think about that anymore. Because when you're when you're shooting and you know that you're only going to be on camera when you're talking, you end up even if it's just subconsciously, you start kind of tailoring what you're doing for that. You like I'm going to try and do everything I want to do when I'm speaking, and that's just like not a healthy. <laughs> it's like not a healthy way to act. <laughs> um, so this this show is like the, the landscape opens up. It was really exciting. It was one of the most exciting things. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the show explores uh, sexuality. Um, your character's sexuality, um, your attacker's sexuality, and as well as the way that it explores sort of sexual assault, because there is a sort of grayness in regards to, to, to both of those. It seems a, that your character at times isn't necessarily sure, that sure, of his sexuality, whereas everybody else wants him to be 100% on it. Does that, is that true? Absolutely, and that was, you know, I think that TV, and not just TV, but like popular culture in general, has a very, traditionally, a very binary approach to sexuality. You, you, you love labels. Labels are great. <laughs> you're, you're, you're gay or you're straight. And if, you, if you're one or the other, you tend to be very much one or the other. And you, you, you know the characters I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and I think that for most people, or at least for a, a large percentage of people, that is not the experience. The experience is not, you know, uh, one or seven. The experience is somewhere in between. There's, there's, a, there's a spectrum of it. These things are fluid. And I think for Taylor, that's where, at least, you know, at least for the run of the series, that's where he is. is he's somewhere in the middle. And, you know, his relationship with Evie, for example, is, it's not, a, it's not a facade. It's not this, like, carefully constructed lie to hide behind. It's genuine. He has genuine feelings for her. He's genuinely attracted to her. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, he has this, for example, in episodes six and seven, he has this kind of new boyfriend. He has this, he's obviously attracted to men. It, you know, there's, 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 there's a gray zone there. And that's, that zone is where American crime lives, not just on this issue, but on every, on every issue. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And, and underrepresented, too. 
100% it's underrepresented, but I also think what's uh, underrepresented, I'm not sure if it should be more represented, but the idea that <laughs> your, attacker, your attacker sees the scenario one way right. and you as the victim see the scenario another way. Yeah. And the show itself isn't necessarily saying, well, it doesn't matter how the attacker sees the scenario. He is the attacker, right? Because right. we see so much from his perspective and it is such a blurry line in regards to this assault. It has more to do with consent alcohol that has been consumed, the way that these photos have sort of gone all over the place and humiliated this person and made them feel like a victim in that regard as well. But then again, we're still seeing a gray area in regards to what is sexual assault. It's, and the truth is, you know, it's, and that's one of the things that I admire most about how John is doing it and how his, all the writers are doing it is that it's like you could easily, that's a tight rope to walk. Like huh, that is that a, is such a tight rope. That is a thin line, like that's, that's dangerous ground. And you could easily, if you did it less gracefully and, and less assuredly, it could easily be a complete disaster. And, and so it, it would be really easy at any point in that process to move away from that. Um, but he's, he's committed to it and he does it, he never missteps. It's really, imp it's really astounding to me. Um, Do you ever feel that you have to sort of think about your performance in that way as no, well, or no. is it just all in the writing and you can kind of just go at it from your character and not think about the sort of thin line that the creators are trying to walk? I try not because it keeps me up at night, or it kept me up at night. You know, you start like you start feeling sweaty because you have no control. You know, you're not writing the scenes. You don't have con you don't you don't know what the trajectory is, so you really have no control over that. And there's nothing you could really, even if I spent. 10 hours a day thinking about it. There's nothing I could do. Like I, you know, you hope, you know that you're, when you're with John, you're in good hands. And that gives you an enormous sense of relief and assurance. Um, and you, and you really use that as your foundation and focus on other things. Because there's enough other, you know, there's enough stuff to focus on. Um, but as far as the stuff with Eric goes, it's like, you know, people are, are people. You know, even people who do terrible things are still people. And people who have terrible things done to them are still people. And people are like, messed up and and uh especially teenagers dear god teenagers are messed up and uh, the sh that's what the show wants to explore and you know it, i think people still i certainly did when, when you start this when you think of sexual assault whether it's male on male or male on female you, th you, you the image you get is like the guy in the ski mask hiding behind a bush who jumps out in an alley at night Which but is such a clear right and i mean exactly clear wrong it's like violent assault yeah. um and that happens and versions of that happen, but a, a large percentage, a, a, the majority of sexual assault is not that. The majority is people you know, your significant other, your spouse, your classmate, your colleague, your uh, a family member. Like it's, 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 and it's so much more complicated and complex and you know, the, the lines of consent, it, it's, it, it depends how you define it. it, it, it it's, so, it's so gray and, and complicated and that's well, where the show lives. There's also this character who, whose only experience with his own sexuality, to a degree, might be a version of a, of a might be versions of assault, which is which which he's experiencing uh, while trying to experiment and and figure things out. So it's kind of like, did did he know that he was doing something that was hurting this other person? Did right. he know that he was doing something that was violating what they uh, what they what was their boundary? You he know, might not have. Eric stands to the end of the you know really till the end of the of the show, he stands by what he's saying. He believes he didn't do it. And you know, you might question as an audience member, you might question how truthful that is or what's behind what he's saying, but he stands by it. And, and Taylor stands very much by what he said. And you're left with these two completely contradictory um, interpretations or accounts of a single event. And just like you are in real life, you know, you have your evidence, you have your, you have your, uh, your stories and you're, you're, you have to make a choice. Um, and uh, it's 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 challenging. Like it's not easy to to watch, but it's also not easy in real life when it happens. It's not easy to watch. It's uh, now episode seven, the episode where you take the gun to school. You said that you don't get scripts until really you start shooting. So just before, yeah, just before. What did you think when you got that story? Did you know that you were going there at all? Not really. I. I knew that something was happening in episode seven because John was coming back to write and direct it. And there were sort of whispers on the grapevine that like seven, seven is the big one, you know, it's like- Like if John comes back, it's the- Well, you know, he only, the only episodes he wrote and directed in the season are episode one and episode seven. Right. So you know that he's not, you know, he's, he's, if, it's, if he's coming back to do both, it's, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, people were saying things like, you know, uh, 
what we what we did in episode in the finale last season, like that level of drama, we want to do that this year in episode seven to give time to explore the fallout. And when you know, and when you've seen last season, you're like, oh my god, like they're gonna do that. Um, so we knew that something was happening in seven, but we didn't, and we knew it was gonna be dramatic and probably violent, but we didn't know what um, specifically it was or who it involved. Uh, so yeah, when I read it, I was um, I was totally in the dark. I guess my first reaction was like sh bone shaking fear, I would say. Um, I, just because it's like, that's a lot. You don't wanna screw it up. You don't wanna screw it up. And you also like, you don't, that's a big change. And you wanna make sure that the work that you've, that you've done up until that point supports it. And like that there's enough of a base. Cause the last thing you want in a show like this, which is so much about uh, kind of verisimilitude and, and you know, believing that these people are real people. What the last thing you want is for something like that to happen and the audience to go, okay, come on. Um, you know, I, that, that's out of nowhere. That's pulled out of thin air. Uh, so it was important to me that, it terrified me at first. I was like, oh, maybe I, have I done enough to see it without knowing it, you know? Maybe that, maybe that one look I gave her in that scene is, you know. What did you think, uh, I mean, you're, you're the performer. Where did you think your character was coming from when the gun did go off? I, I, I personally saw it as a moment of self-defense and that he was ready to walk away from this and was sort of reclaiming a certain amount of, of peace. Yeah, that's, that's sort of how I saw it too, is that, you know, he, he was, he's in a bad place yeah. at that moment. He, you know, he, he, just, he was just leaving the school from planning to shoot uh, multiple Leslie, people, multiple people, but Leslie first, and he realized he had a moment or a couple moments of realization where he was like, "What am I doing? You know, this kind of fractured, broken state that I'm in is is temporary. I I, I need to not. I need to leave." Um, and right at that moment when he's, a, which is of course what makes it more more tragic, but right at that moment when he's about to leave it behind, literally, uh, this. This, this, uh, this guy jumps out and, and kind of thrusts him immediately back into that. Also so threatens him. Threatens him violently, uh, verbally, emotionally. And it's like, the way I thought about it was like, he's like getting like literally yanked, li literally and figuratively yanked backwards. Right. Um, and it's, it's, it's like he doesn't even, it's not like he decides in that moment, he makes a choice to like, I'm gonna, right now I'm gonna kill this kid. It's just, it's, it's a reaction. Um, and... And what was really interesting was when we were shooting that, John, we did a few takes and, you know, it's it a weird scene, so we're, it's a weird mood. And John came up to me and said, you know, I really, for a moment, just for a moment, I need you to look at, after the gun goes off, I need you to look at him with total empathy. Um, so I don't know if that comes across, but I think that gives a, an insight into where John was coming from, is that... It's, it's a real shift in the dynamic, and that, you know, it has extremely negative repercussions, obviously, but just for a moment, Taylor feels different. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way to think about it. Now, before I turn this over to uh, audience questions, we should say that the uh, finale is, is tonight. Oh, yeah, I, I should plug it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to give you that chance. Uh, what tonight, ABC, 10, 9 Central. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you much. <laughs> um, but Please what, watch it. Uh, what can, do you have a little tease for us? Like, what can we expect happen to your character this evening? Um, you know, it's, he's in a system now. He's, he's part of a system, and he's faced with numerous ways to navigate that system, some better than others. And I think for Taylor, all the characters go through a lot, obviously, in the finale, but for Taylor, it's, he's so, for all season long, things have only happened to him, terrible things mainly, but he's, he's been in a, a very passive position. He's had to react or not react to things. And when he, the one time he tried to make a choice and tried to do something, that went obviously terribly. Um, so I think the finale for Taylor is about trying to find a space where he can reclaim that ability to make choice. And like, whether the, even if it's a choice between like unfortunate options, there's something within the ability to make a choice that is inherently optimistic. So I saw the ending as hopeful and as optimistic. Uh, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I, I saw there was a kernel of something there, and I think that's what the show is about. Absolutely. Let's uh, turn it over to audience questions. Hi, Connor. Thank you so much for being oh, here hi. today. Hi. Um, my question is, what's the difference from working on American Crime to when you worked on Falling Skies? Um, it's, it's very different. Uh, it's, 
it's so different that it's all, it's it's really it was really interesting because I had I was on a show called Falling Skies, which is a sci-fi show on um, on TNT for m many years, for like five years. And uh, what was interesting, I went, I f we finished that last a year ago now, and then were you on it for all five? Yeah. And then and then you know six months went by, and then I got an American Crime. And what what was really interesting to me is that it has the same structure in the sense that it's a television show. You know, it has the same, you know, you shoot eight days an episode, you have a crew of this size with this, but you know, so it has the same basic mechanism. But other than that, everything was different. Like it was the, almost the diametric opposite. Uh, Amer uh, Falling Skies was running and jumping and explosions and a lot of like standing around tables being like, I think we should go west and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, and you were often part of like huge scenes and it was just like very kinetic whereas American Crime is like long scenes sitting across tables tight close-ups it's it's really it's 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 the inverse um, which was at first very terrifying because it was unfamiliar uh, but was really like perfect like it was exactly what I needed like Falling Skies for five years gave me like a playground to like fail over and over and over again and for it not to seem that bad because there were other, like there were flashier things going on around me. Um, uh, you know, no one cares if you botched that like line delivery when there's like a car blowing up behind you. Um, but on American Crime, you don't have that, that um, excuse. So I, I'm, I guess I'm just, it's a long way of saying like, I'm glad I did Falling Skies then American Crime, not the other way around. <laughs> Do you find, I mean, you seem like a person who is relatively knowledgeable and committed to the craft, not just acting, but of filmmaking and is paying attention to what's around you in regards to the director that you're working with. Do you find that yourself that you want a career leaning more towards doing more stuff like American Crime or, or Falling Skies? You know, I, uh, whatever comes, like I, I, <laughs> I, I wish I could be that that picky, uh, I, they, they're both great. You know, they came, like I said, they came at the right time. I learned a lot on Falling Skies. I learned a lot on American Crime in very different ways. I, my personal inclination is probably more towards something like this. Um, you know, as an actor, it's, it's, more, it's more fun, to be honest, just because you feel, like it's an actor show. Like you watch it, the show's 90% close-ups. It's, 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 you know. The show loves its actors. The show loves like pores. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, and it really is like it lives and dies on its acting. Like that's the that's the hill that it fights on. And 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 Falling Skies was very different. So as an actor, uh, you know, American Crime is is a little more dynamic. But Falling Skies was an enormous amount of just like visceral fun. You know, like shooting an AK-47 where you like jump over a pile of rubble is like a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so I I going back and forth, I don't think would would hurt me. Next question. Hi. Um, my question sort of piggybacks off of that. I was wondering sort of what the tone was like on set. Like you're dealing with a lot of heavy subject matter and sometimes it may be a little heavy on set or it may be hard to not take home with you. So I was wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's it, you know, the show is very serious. Um, do you have to, when you're approaching certain subjects in a certain way, you have to, you know, you can't, you can't really be cracking jokes between between takes too much um, and John takes the show very seriously and he's very focused and he works very very hard and he juggles a lot of ball you know it's it's he's very serious about it in the best possible way and so you because that it can be bad like if people are super serious about something it can be really depressing um, but John just like you know he's coming at it from a from a good place and that he cares about it and not only does he care about it but he cares about you like he 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 would when he felt like the crew was getting, like, they were getting a bit worn down, he would, like, bring in masseuses, and, like, between takes, like, our gaffers would go and get massages on John. It's he's, like, he's got a pretty healthy dichotomy as well. Like, he does, yeah. Have, have him up here, and he would go from, you know, on the verge of tears, talking yeah. about how important it was to him, to very quickly kind of mocking himself for getting close to being to tears and laughing. I, I had no jokes. idea. I, had, I should have done more basic research on him. I had no idea until, like, two or three weeks into shooting that, like, his background... Stand is up. in stand-up comedy, yeah. and like he wrote on Fresh Prince, like he, like, <laughs> like it's crazy. Like you watch American Crime or you watch uh, Twelve Years a Slave, and you, <laughs> you would never guess. But I the think the guy knows how to tell a joke. He just has chosen not to. Exactly, <laughs> it's a choice. And I think you, like, I think genuinely, I think you feel that. Like I think that he, despite his seriousness and despite his uh, 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 particularness, he it's coming from, it's not, he's not coming from a clinical place. He's coming from, like, he deeply feels 
for these characters and for these subjects. Um, and I think you feel that on the show. Uh, I certainly felt that on set. So that helped sort of, to answer your question, that helped mitigate the, the dourness of it. Um, and also, you know, you have, you're working two or three days a week because of the way the show's structured. So you have a lot of free time to like do karaoke and stuff and <laughs> try. That was Austin. Uh, Austin was fun. I, li I actually know, I know it's strange considering the plot of the show, but Joey Polari, who plays Eric in the show, and I were roommates while we were shooting. Um, so he would go off one day and like say terrible things about me, and I would go off the next day and say terrible things about him, and then we'd come home and like watch movies and like sing Taylor Swift karaoke. It was great. What's um, your favorite T Swift karaoke song? Uh, hmm, because we we alternated between like the newer, more popular ones and like the like the good old ba like country ballads. Um, is Twenty One considered a, a ballad, or is that the, one of the newer ones? That's one of the twenty two, twenty two, twenty one. Twenty one, isn't it? I don't know. I think 22. Is it 22? Thank you. Is it tw oh, dear God. No, oh, 22 is a... S right, yeah. See, I'm not very good. I I'm not a very good fan. <laughs> it was, we, al we alternated between Taylor Swift and, like, Disney songs. We sung a lot of, we sung a lot of like, Aladdin and The Little Mermaid. Um, so, yeah, American Crime, guys. <laughs> that sounds like one. No, sorry. Online viewer. So Madison says, American crime is stylized with a lot of tight close-ups. Can you talk about crafting your acting choices around that? It's an interesting question. I, you don't really change much. Like, if you, if you start thinking about where the, you know, you have to think about where the camera is in the sense of, like, I'm going to turn this way or I'm going to, uh, but if you start changing the way you act based on that, I think, I, like, I just seems like the wrong way to think about it. Um, uh, so no, I, I don't think I really changed much. Uh, you definitely feel the camera, but because the, show, the show's very close up, but it's shot on longer lenses, so the camera's never, it's camera's very rarely right up in your face. So you're, you're not, um, you, you don't feel it physically. Uh, you certainly feel it when you, when you watch it, but you don't feel it physically, uh, which is a help. I think we have time for one more question. How's it going? Thanks for being here. Thank you. So the theme of crime has always been very big in entertainment, but I feel like last year and this year especially, it's really like increased its presence. We've got like True Detective, American Crime, uh, People vs. O.J. Simpson, Making a Murderer. What do you think it is that draws people to want to watch crime happen like on the screen? Oh God, um, I don't know. It's like you know, I. When I was on Falling Skies, people used to ask like a, a different but similar question. When they're like, "What? Why do people love post-apocalyptic shows so much?" And you know, I think you could say it about any genre. Is like it, it represents um, crime fiction, whether it's in in TV or film or uh, literature or anywhere. Kind of represents a world that most people hopefully don't know. They don't have access to. You know, you haven't. Um, uh, for example, no. Hopefully, most people in their life haven't killed anyone. But you, when you watch TV and you watch um, movies, you can you can kind of get a window into what that would experience would be like. You get you, it's and it's that is exciting to people, and it's exciting in a negative way and in a positive way. Um, and I think American Crime has elements of that, but I think it tries to upend that. It tries to I think what separates it from some from more typical crime shows is that it's not a crime show. It's like it's not despite the title, it's not. Um, it's not about crime. It's not uh, an expose of crime. It's 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 a it's an examination of the the effects of crime. Um, uh, so uh, the psychology and the, cri and the crime sure. that our culture kind of creates. Well, that's the thing. It's like how the you know because the the actual crime happens before the show. So the, the show's really about how the culture and how the system and how different systems compound the crime. You know how. T the trauma exists before the show even starts, but there's so much additional trauma, especially in sexual assault, and this is one of the worst things about it in the real world, is that man or woman is that you have to prove it. You, you get torn apart. P you tell a story and people poke holes in it. You have to prove that this happened to you. And it's terrible. It's like, it's, it's, it's to have to go through that, to, to bring yourself to a place where you're okay to talk about it and to, to, to to bring it up and then to have that happen. Um, and especially in Taylor's case where he's not okay to talk about it. it, it gets thrust on him by social media and by his mom in some cases. Um, you know, it's really, it's tragic. 
Well, Connor, uh, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on an amazing performance this season on American Crime. Thank you very much. Hey, guys, tonight at 10 o'clock, right? Sorry? Tonight at 10 o'clock. Tonight, 10, 9 central. <laughs> American Crime. Thank Connor, you. Thank you.